Good morning again. It's good to see each of you. I'm going to pull this over. I think we're up and running. People in the back, can you tell me? Is that good? We good? Come this way? We've been greeted with all kinds of technology issues the last couple of Sunday mornings, and it has uh, thrown me for a little bit of a loop, but uh, it is what it is. I told y'all, uh, I mentioned last week when I got up here, I was talking about brain fog, post-COVID brain fog, and whether or not I would have any of that. I haven't really had brain fog, but about five minutes before church started last Sunday, my left ear totally clogged up. And so uh, it's weird when you're speaking and you're already hearing your reflection and echo, and then you can't hear out of one ear. Uh, my ears still clogged up. I'm, I'm okay. I, uh, I know what's wrong, and I'm being treated for it. But uh, it's one of those things. So, th- so this morning, I'm still here and uh, still feeling great, but still clogged up. So if I seem a little brain foggy, or if I get lost at times, it's because I'm having a hard time hearing myself. And uh, but I'm thankful you're here. And my prayer this morning is that the things that I try to communicate this morning uh, will be a blessing to you. Uh, I have, sometimes as preachers, lessons just happen and they just kind of come naturally. And sometimes we fight with lessons. Sometimes the lessons that we fight with end up being some of the most important lessons that we give. Uh, And there's a reason we were having to fight with them and struggle with them. I've been fighting with this one this week, uh, knowing the right things to say. And I hope that I'm able to do that this morning. My, My prayer is that you will be graceful with me as I try to present the stuff this morning. And my prayer is that it will be meaningful to you. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things about faith and working through faith is it's messy. We don't always agree on everything. Uh, and there's room for some disagreement inside the church. And we need to have those healthy disagreements. Uh, my prayer always, though, is if you have any, ever have any issue with anything I say, please, uh, I, I would love to hear that. And I would love to talk those things out with you. I need to be sharpened by you as I seek to sharpen you each week. And so uh, as we go through this period, I just want uh, to stop before we start. And if you would join me in prayer, I want to pray that the words I speak this morning will be powerful and impact you, but also be the right words and the words God would want us to hear. Let's pray together. God, uh, I come to you right now selfishly seeking the prayers of this church and your people. I pray that you will give me uh, wisdom to use the right words, to write tone, and convey what you would want conveyed to your people. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm also chewing gum, so if you hear the smacking, I'm sorry. That's to try to keep my ear I'm trying to keep my ear a little bit less clogged. So if you hear smacking, especially those listening on TV, all they hear is what's in this microphone, so they're probably going to get to hear a lot of gum chewing today, so I apologize in advance. Uh, We're continuing our series in Ecclesiastes. Uh, We will be in this probably for two more weeks. We've went chapter one, chapter two, and we're doing chapter three today, and Ecclesiastes is a much longer book. I encourage you to go back and read it. Uh, One of the things about Ecclesiastes is after it, it introduces in these first four or five chapters a lot of the main themes... And then it kind of repeats those main themes. So we're not going to go all the way through the end of the book, but we'll spend a couple more weeks in the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to do just a quick review of uh, what it is that we've went through uh, so far. Um, we, week one, we were in Ecclesiastes 1, and we just talked about being present, being still, being in the moment, allowing ourselves to, to sit and be content sitting. And we've we kind of started to introduce this concept of contentment, where we find contentment, and how contentment is something that we as Christians should be seeking out. And so the way we do that is we, have a, a, we don't have to be constantly pulling our mind, but rather about what's next here, there. And we began talking this week about how a lot of people will put a lot of faith in the, the wisdom that they'll acquire in this world. And while wisdom is not inherently bad, Wisdom also needs to be tempered with knowing that you can't wise up to the point of being God and you can't wise up to the point of having understanding of it all because there's just simply things that are incomprehensible. 
They're above our pay grade. They're bigger than us. And so with us having that realization, we need to seek to be present in the here and now. And then we talked about that contentment in Ecclesiastes 2 as we talked about riches. That contentment is not something that we earn. It's not something we find. It's not something we achieve. But rather, this is a God-given grace. And the text talks about the fact that God gives this happiness and contentment. He allows us to have uh, this balance in our lives. And so we want to be able to, to lean into God's promises, not the promises of this earth, the promises of the things of this earth, that the, the earth will suddenly give us happiness and joy. No, we'll find our joy. We'll find our contentment. We'll find that we can be still in the peace that passes understanding that's found in God, in Jesus, and in the sweet spirit. And so this morning, we will uh, move into Ecclesiastes 3. You may not know any other text from Ecclesiastes. You probably know a couple of texts that you've heard in your life. Uh, if you've only had, you probably know the end of the book, which we'll get to in the next couple of weeks. You probably know Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 1. Uh, part of that is because... It was made into a popular song uh, in the 70s. Uh, it's, it's something that you've probably heard repeated. It sometimes makes its way over into secular thinking and thought. Um, and it's a, a pause in the text. It's poetry in the middle of this text um, to give us a little wisdom about the nature of life. And remember that when we study Ecclesiastes, we are studying one of, the th one of the wisdom books that we have, you also find Proverbs and Job's to be what we call wisdom literature. And these books um, are, are primary for us to understand the bigger picture of how the world works, how life works, but also it grounds us in understanding that we can't understand it all. And so that's why those books taken as a whole, and I really think um, that if you're going to go off on a study in, in Ecclesiastes, it's really good to also spend some time in Job and Proverbs because those balances really do a good job of balancing with and, and balancing our thinking and measuring out our thinking. But this text reminds us that there is a season for everything. It also reminds us that no season lasts forever. That there's going to be times and places and things in seasons of life in which they're going to come and they're going to go and there's going to be, there's the extremes of life. There's times for this and there's times for that. And there's times for everything in between in this earth and in this place. That's why sometimes in life, life will be going smooth and it'll be going good. And sometimes in life, life stinks. And we go through tough stuff. And we struggle through and we're fighting within ourselves, and we're fighting with family, we're fighting with work, we're fighting with, you know, there's just times in life that things are good, and there's times in life when things are bad, and there's a season, the text tells us, there's a time for everything, and there's a season for every activity under the sun and under the heavens. There, there's a time and a place in which everything has its place and its moment and its time. And the author says, there's, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's, there's these markers on your tombstone, and there's, there's this time that's going to mark on your tombstone the day that you were born. There's this time that's going to be marked the day that you died. And you know, we, that whole thing about the dash, you know, the thing in the middle. What do we spend? We have all the time in the middle. There's extremes, there's, there's the joy of life, and then there's the horror of death, and we have everything in the middle. He said there's a time to plant and there's a time to uproot. You, there's a, uh, I've recently gotten into more uh, planting. Uh, I, I do hydroponic gardening and I really enjoy that. And, it's, uh, you know, and there's joy in time to plant, but the real joy is when the tomato finally turns red. Okay? So that takes a long time, just telling y'all. It's way too long. Um, when that sweet pepper goes from green to red. You know, the, there's these times... In life, there are the two extremes, and then there's everything in the middle. All the work and the care and the things that have to go in to making sure that plant goes from one to the other. There's a time for everything. He said there's a, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down. There's a time to build. There's a time to weep. And there's a time to laugh. And sometimes 
There's a time to do both at the same time, isn't there? There's a time to mourn and to sit and to, to be still with the idea that death is a reality we face. But there's also a time to dance. There's a time to have joy. There's a time to celebrate. We love to celebrate. He says there's a time to scatter. And there's a time to gather. Scatter stones, there's a time to gather them up. There's a time to embrace. And there's a time to refrain from embracing. We've had that for a while, haven't we? There's a time to search. And there's a time in which the searching has went on so long, it's time to finally give up the search. And then you have the search that... That uh, you, you you know this search right you you've all I, I don't y'all probably don't lose stuff as much as I lose stuff I lose stuff a lot my wife's not didn't say amen out loud but she thought it okay I lose a lot of stuff but you always have to balance is how much is this thing worth to me and how much time do I spend searching for this thing there's a time to search there's a time to give up there's a time to a time to keep and a time to throw away. There's a time to tear and there's a time to mend, a time to be silent. Amen. We need to learn that one more. But there's also a time we've got to speak. We've got to let it be known what it is that is on our hearts, especially when they're the things of God. There's a time to love. And there's even a time to hate. You know, we're not called to hate people, but there are things that we hate. We hate what God hates. And there's a time when we see the realities of this world and we see things like like lying you know god hates lying he hates a lying tongue and we hate that too god hates death that's why he came and he became flesh and he overcome death it's because he hates death there's a time for war in this world and there's a time for peace and by the way the author's not even saying hey it's it's a good time you know he's not even making recognition of whether or not war is good, a peace is definitely good. He's just simply saying, there's times that we're going to spend, and there's going to be war, and there's going to be things that are really on our heart, and there's going to be times that we're going to have peace. There's going to be vast experiences in the human experience. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. And sometimes in the bad days, if we're being honest, if we're telling the truth, I think we've all asked in bad days, where is my God? And I would propose to you that he's there in those bad days. Uh, I was, I use this vernacular all the time, but I heard a sermon preaching on this this week. And he talked about the fact that sometimes, sometimes we don't really act like God is there. And sometimes our speech betrays us. It says some things about us. When we pray, we have this thing we say, uh, be with Aunt Susie, she's sick. Have you ever really thought about what that implies? Be with Aunt Susie. If we're asking God to go be with Aunt Susie, what does that say about where we think God is now? I know we don't mean it that way, right? But sometimes our words think that is to speak out something that's deep in our heart that, that sometimes we don't really recognize that God is always present he was already there with aunt Susie before we asked him to go be with aunt Susie I understand we're, we're wanting comfort for aunt Susie we're wanting we're wanting peace for aunt Susie we're healing for aunt Susie I understand when we say that there's a lot more to behind that than just saying God you're not with her go be with her but I would encourage I'm trying to work into my prayer life to quit using that verbiage and instead, we, we praise God that He is present in storms. And He's right there with us going through the storms. God does not promise Christians an easy life. He doesn't promise you a life free of storms. But He does promise that He will be present in the storm with us. God is not an aloof deist God. There's, there's too much deism in our world. Deism is the thought that God... Uh, kind of create earth as this cosmic experience that he's going to put people on earth and he's going to kind of just he, he was the creator and he let it be but put people on earth and he's just going to kind of let it all figure it out for itself that's not the kind of god that we know 
And, and there's some people uh, that unfortunately teach some form of this where, where they don't think God's as active today as He used to be. And while, while we may not see some miraculous things that maybe sometimes, some rare times in the world have seen, I, I would venture to say that many times the reason we don't see God here and we don't see God present is because we're not looking for Him. We don't have our eyes focused on God. So there's constant, we need to, this reminds us, and, and the author here is going to remind us that, that God ultimately, in His time and in His work, is going to reveal that He was always present with us. Let's continue on and see what the rest of the text says. He said, what do workers gain from their toil? And this goes back, uh, this, this concept of work, what do we gain from the here and now? And we talked about that last week. If, if this is Solomon speaking, he talks about all the things that he built, all the things that he accomplished. And at the end of the day, you know, he had to pass it on to somebody behind him who didn't have the same appreciation for it that he had because it was just stuff. What do workers gain from their toll, he asked. He says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. God has allowed us to go through this, and he calls it a burden. And life, friends, if we're honest, is a burden. I'm not saying it's not a joy. It is. But it is also a burden. It's a struggle. It's tough. And he says, and this is, this is my favorite, my favorite, maybe my favorite verse in this whole book. He has made everything beautiful in its time. The sourness, the bitterness, the hate, the... The bad stuff, it doesn't stay that way. But God makes everything beautiful when it's time. And He has set eternity into the human heart. He, he has made us yearn for something more on the other side. He's, he's made us want something that's better and more full than this life. Yet... No one, he, he, he gives this balance here, and this, we're going to spend a lot of time in this concept of already but not yet, right? So God has already declared eternity. We have some images of eternity, but let's just be honest. If you sat down a hundred people in a room and you asked them, all right, what happens when we die? If we're being really honest, you set a hundred preachers down into a room, you've set a hundred members down into a room, guess how many answers you're going to get that are different? A hundred. Because... It tells us right here, listen, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. You can't understand eternity. You may be able to understand concepts of eternity, but it's bigger than your little mind can handle. So what do we do? What do Christ followers do? Do we, do we just spend all time thinking about this eternity that's set into our, our heart? But if we spend all of our time doing that, look what happens. He says, you can't even understand it. So we just spend all of our time focusing on something we can't even understand wholly. He's creating this, this rub, this, this conflict, and he's asking us to sit in the middle of it and work this out. And that's what we're going to seek to do a little bit this morning. C.S. Lewis said this about it. He said, the Christian says creatures are not born with desires Unless satisfaction for those desires exist. He said, a baby feels hunger. There's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. There's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I was made for something different. I can't find total fulfillment in this world. I was made for another world. He says, if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. There's no proof that because we can't find total satisfaction in the here and now, that that means that the, the here and now isn't real. As a matter of fact, I'm going to encourage us this morning as we study through this to, re to recognize and what C.S. Lewis would go on in his, in later in this quote, if you go back and read through the rest of it, he's going to say, listen, the fact that things are now, and we get these glimpses now, 
that, that proves God. It doesn't disprove God. It proves God that He set something in our heart. And I would say that the, Solomon tells us that, it's, that He has set eternity in our hearts. But it's frustrating at times because we can't quite totally grasp our mind on eternity. So eternity in our hearts does a couple things. Obviously, it points us to what is and what will be. The new heavens and the new earth, what, what that will look like, the images of what that will look like, it, it points us towards those things. But it also grounds us here in recognizing that the more we think about those things, sometimes this is just reality for me. Maybe you're different, but uh, it shouldn't be in my mind, I don't guess. In my mind, I, my mind, there's something logical that says that the more you think about eternity, the more you should want to be there and do, and I, there's sometimes that's true, but sometimes when I think about eternity, I just kind of end up frustrated because I'm like, why are we not there yet, right? Well, I think it's because we were not made to live our lives just trying to get to the next life. We were made for more than that. We were made for more than that. The Ecclesiastes, the writer continues, he says, I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good. Notice this. He said, there's n eternity is in your heart, but the very best thing that you can do is to be happy and to do good while you live. You were made to live here. It's why we have an innate desire. We, we see when someone takes their own life, what do we say? That's not natural. Somebody shouldn't feel that because we have this innate desire to live. When, when people are, are crossing over into the stage of life where they realize that they're, they're about to, to pass away. I was watching this in a movie last night. Somebody had been diagnosed with cancer and they were going to die young. And she said, I don't want to die. You know, there's something else. We, we don't want to leave because because there's something. God made us to live here and to want to live here. He says that each of them may eat and drink. You can live in the here and the now and you can find satisfaction in all your work. And he says this is, notice this again, because this goes back to what we talked about last week. This is the gift of God. It's something God gives us. The satisfaction of being happy working here and now. The idea that we, we talk about this when we talk about finding a job. Find something you love to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life, right? Um, some people work, like the things they do on this earth, the work that they do, the, the work they do to make a living, they, they hate it, okay? Has anybody here ever been a job they hated? Okay, we've all been there, right? I think most all of us have been in a job we've hated. And it's not a fun way to live, is it? It kind of throws everything off. He says, you need to understand that there's nothing better than be able to live and work and find satisfaction not in trying to get through work. Because that's why when we have a bad job, what's the best time of the day? Five o'clock, right? The, the minute we can get off work, whatever time that is. He says, you need to understand, Psalm says, you need to understand that that when we expand this out, not to just the work we do, but the work we do while here on earth, there's nothing better than living a life where you can find satisfaction in knowing that you're doing good. And find satisfaction in knowing that God blesses the work that we do. So we live in this reality of what it is, but what is to come. But we're made to live the here and the now, and to live in the moment, and to enjoy Life here on earth. We're made for more. And he says, surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. He says, you know, you're going to die just like your dog dies, just like your hamster dies, just like your goldfish dies. Everybody's going to die. As one dies, so dies the other. Everybody's going to die. All have the same breath. You've got a chance at life. Humans have no advantage over animals. And he repeats this thought. Everything is meaningless. It's just a chasing after the wind. The things on this earth are so temporary, but it doesn't leave it there. He says, so I saw that there's nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work. Find joy in this life. Because that is their lot. 
can we sit where we're at and be happy while here on earth? He says, for who can bring them to see what will happen after them? You know, we can't spend our whole life just trying to escape to heaven. Okay? That may sound controversial. Uh, I, I want to go to heaven. Okay? And let's be clear. I want you to go to heaven. And at the end of this life, there's nothing more important than the fact that you were right with God and you get to spend eternity with God. But God did not just create you to exist and then hopefully survive and then get off on the other side. He made us to live now for so much more. So this is what I would propose to you. I would propose to you that the mission is not to get to the kingdom there. When Jesus says the kingdom is near and the kingdom is at hand, when Jesus comes and He brings the kingdom, and the kingdom is now a present reality, the mission is to build the kingdom here. The mission is that now we're part of the kingdom. What if survival was not the ultimate goal? Think with me what it's like to go into survival mode. I wrote this. And this is, I'm going to read a little bit to you. Consider shows like Alone or Survivor. The goal is to make enough progress just to get by and get home. You build, and you see the people building. They build these temporary structures, and they want to make it a month. They want to make it two months, but they build these structures. But you know what you don't see when somebody's put on a deserted island? You don't see somebody arrive on the island and say, hmm, I wonder if there's oil under this ground. I wonder if I could build me a power plant here. No, you see them say, let me build a little fire. Let me kill me a squirrel. Let me throw some sticks up. Let me hunker down and survive. The Christian's life on earth is not survival mode. You weren't placed here in some cosmic version of naked and afraid where God places naked people on the earth and says, figure it all out. Our mission is not just to survive until the, the day that Jesus comes again or to the day that we're placed into the ground. We were created with an innate desire for eternity. But for those of us who understand the biblical concept of kingdom, our eternity does not start the day that we die. Our eternity starts the day that we're born again. Our mission is about walking with Jesus in the here and the now. And we bring pieces of the kingdom to broken creation. Jesus' mission was to build a kingdom here with all that it entails. It wasn't a physical kingdom, it was a spiritual kingdom. Jesus' mission was, it should become fully our mission. Therefore, if it was part of Jesus' life, it's part of our life. We acknowledge this, that all of our efforts, when you combine them together, they're going to be inept at the end of the day. They're not going to complete the mission of fulfilling the kingdom. And that ultimately it will only be brought to perfection when the regeneration of Jesus will come. That realization that we will do a work that we cannot finish does not change the mission that it is our work in the here and the now. That's why Ecclesiastes and the biblical narrative tells us that while we find joy, we find our joy not in the completion of work, but we find our joy in the work itself, living the Christian life. That realization is not us admitting defeat. That is us living in His victory. It's us engaging in the seasons of life. What does that mean practically? Practically, that means while there will always be injustice in this world, it's our duty to be voices of justice for the disenfranchised now. We will thrive when we engage in this work because God made this part of His mission on earth. It will be our mission, but God will finish the work. 
Practically, that means that while the poor will always be with us, we want to see less people merely just surviving, and we want to see more people thriving. And we will thrive when we engage the work of serving the poor. God will finish the work. Practically, that means while the world is telling people that you can choose your own sexual ethic, we lovingly present a counter-reality. We do it with love, but we present it. We will thrive when we live out and promote a godly sexual ethic. And God will ultimately finish the work. Practically, that means while the world is battling and trying to make millions concerning the environment, and we don't know what to believe, we seek instead to live quietly as faithful stewards of what God has allowed us to control. We'll thrive when we live mindful lives that show our concern for the earth that God has given us. And God will ultimately finish the work. Practically, it means that while the world will provoke revenge and warmongering, we seek to be the peacemakers that God has called us to be. Turning the other cheek is not weakness, it's strength. And living in strength. We will thrive when we truly embody and promote the mentality of peace that will ultimately reign in the, in the eternal kingdom. And God will finish the work. People who are surviving but not living and promoting the riches that God provides us today will never live the content life that God provides for us. Survival... And merely surviving doesn't lead to immeasurable peace. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I've heard these sentiments my whole life. And while they're well-intentioned, and I wouldn't even say they're wrong per se, I'm afraid at times it's created a church culture of escapism. The idea that the Christian's goal is just to escape. If our mission is just to sneak out of here, we never build. We just do enough to survive. And that's what we'll do. We'll simply survive. Survival is made necessary at times. There's times that that's all we can muster as people of faith. It's all we can find ourselves to do. But it was never meant for us to live that way permanently. Survival is not attractive. I watch shows like the ones I mentioned, and nothing in me says I want to go live and sleep tonight. I want to get out of this comfortable bed and go sleep under some sticks in the middle of nowhere with a gazillion mosquitoes. That just never looks attractive to me. Survival is not the life that others see, and they ask, you know, I want to be a part of that. Survival is not the abundant life. A survival mentality makes us dependent on governments and politicians and policies to give us these temporary little pieces of comfort because we're just trying to hang on. Well, we're certainly called to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. I want to remind you that that language that Jesus uses is figurative. What's it figurative of? How do we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven? Jesus lived in the already but the not yet. He taught of the future, but he made his world better in the here and the now. Laying up treasures is done down here when we live the life God calls us to. The Christian's mission is not to escape this earth, but rather is to take on God's mission of redeeming it and making it new. If our goal on earth is just to survive, then we're going to miss out on the blessings of the kingdom here and now. We were made for more. So don't miss heaven. I've said that many times in my life. I remember the last youth group I left. That's the last thing I said. Don't miss heaven. But I kind of regret that being my last words. Because I really want. And if I could go back I would say this. Don't miss today. That's the lesson of Ecclesiastes 3. That's the mission of. The kingdom. To build the kingdom here. Now. We see this in just a couple of places. I want to take a couple of little places real quick before we close out. Matthew 13 talks about a couple of parables. The parable of the kingdom of the mustard seed. I love it because it talks about the fact that the kingdom was going to grow. And the kingdom that God came to establish in Jesus. And he comes and establishes this kingdom. He says it's on its way. It's already, but it's not yet. 
We're already living in the kingdom, but there's more to come. He says it's going to be like a mustard seed, and though it's small, it's going to start out by just merely this carpenter man that's from this unpopular place. Not a lot of people live there, nothing special about it. It's going to grow and it's going to become the largest garden plant. It's going to impact everything you see. Uh, we preached on this, this parable before. I've talked about the fact that you can't go anywhere in this world without seeing the impact of Christianity. You can't go to a hospital. You can't go to a school. You can't go anywhere without seeing that's been touched by Christianity in our world. And he says that it's going to become this small thing, but it's going to become so big that the purge can come along. They can, birch his, they can sit on it because it's going to be so huge. The mustard seed is going to grow exponentially. And he told him another parable. He says, it's like the kingdom is heaven is like yeast that a woman, take, a woman took and she mixed it into about 60 pounds of, of flour until it works, until it was all the way through the dough. Christianity is going to impact everything that this world sees and knows. And ultimately, Christ is going to bring this to fulfillment as he makes everything right. So if our goal on earth is just to survive, do we miss out on the blessings of this massive growing kingdom that God wants us to enjoy and live in in the here and now? So my, be my begging of you is this. Don't miss heaven. Enjoy thoughts of heaven. God placed that eternity in your heart to realize there's more to the life than this. But live the Christian life today. Because there's joy in that. There's power in that. And it changes the people that are around you. If you want to make a difference, it's not just to, you know, we say this, goals to get to heaven brings me people with us as we can. But that's not going to happen unless they see us living a life now that has joy in it. Because the Christian life is joy. The Christian life is the only place where we can find the peace that passes understanding. It's the only place that we can live a life that God intended for us. You were made for more than just escaping. You were made to live. Let us live. Let's pray. God, you made us for more. And in this, this season we've been in in life, there's been the, a real threat of ours to just Turn on survival mode. To just make it from one day to the next. And we see that a lot of people are unsatisfied because of that. And a lot of people are frustrated and flustered. We've seen reports of the suicide rates going up and things. Because, God, we, we realize we were made for more than just surviving. And we place our lives into your hands and ask you to mold them into something more help us to make a difference in the life of our community help us to make a difference in the life of those that have less or are treated poorly help us to live out the Christian life realizing that Whatever was your mission when you were on earth in flesh in Jesus, that that is our mission too. Jesus spent a lot of time talking about what was to come, but he, he made his world better. May that be our hope. May we live this day with a kingdom mindset. Build your kingdom here. Change the atmosphere. We pray. God, we love you. And we need you in our life to feel whole and complete. And there's an emptiness when you're not active in our life. And we know you're always here, but there's, when we're not seeking you, there's just an emptiness that we feel. And God, fill our lives with joy. Make this life the abundant life. Make it attractive for those who don't know it. Make them want to be a part because they see joy in us. Let us be happy people. And while we know there are seasons for mourning, God, and there are seasons that we're going to struggle, God, just be with us during those seasons. 
that people even in those seasons see a joy in us and a peace in us that doesn't make sense to them. Help us to put off the aroma of Jesus into the world. Build your kingdom here. Use our hands. Use our feet. Use our words. And may you be glorified in it all. In Jesus, the church together says, Amen. Thank you so much. I love you all. I want you to be the best people that you can be. I want you to live an abundant life found in Jesus. If you're not living out that life today, I, I just I want to encourage you um, to start today seeking to build the relationship with Jesus because you're never going to find contentment here. It's going to be a world. You're going to live a world and a life of frustration until you make Jesus the center of your life. Make Jesus important in your life and He will bring peace to you. We all want peace. Do you want peace, church? Amen. May we find peace in Jesus. If you have a spiritual need, we want to be hands and feet that serve to you today. If you have any spiritual need, you can come while we'll stand and sing together.